evening, New Beginning Church, and our online family and friends, we thank you for joining us on tonight for Bible study. God is such a good God because he allowed us to come back out here again, and we are just so thankful for that. Dolores Sattler of Holy Trinity Baptist Church sends me a devotional. And one of the devotionals that she sent me this week reads, some days are 10 plus, and then others barely make it to one. She says, some days you're on fire with enthusiasm and excitement, and then some days you want to go back to bed. She says, some days you feel like you're invincible, and others you feel like, what happened? God says to stay committed, stay determined, and stay faithful. Committed people see dreams come to pass and reach the fullness of their destiny. And she closes it out with Joshua 1 and 9. Joshua, the first chapter, verse number 9b. And it says, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. And that is just good news that to us. News. And Amen. I know that we Amen. all are going through something. And so we just have to learn to depend on Jesus. The song says, I'm learning how to lead and depend on Jesus. He's my friend and he's my God, we thank you, Father God, for just being good and being God. Lord, we thank you, Father, that through you we can learn how to live. And through you, Father God, Jesus will strengthen us. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins and bless our lives, Father God, to recognize you in everything we do. Bless us, Father God, that we will move forward in your name and in your will. Bless us tonight, Father God, as we study your word. Bless your word to be relevant. Bless your word to be clear. Bless your word to be accurate. Their lives will be changed. Hearts will be renewed. And relationships will be built. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. To the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. Amen. I'm learning how to lean and depend on Jesus. Oh, he's my friend. Yes, he is. And he's my guide. I'm 
Second John, Second John, the book is Second John, uh, verses will be one through six for tonight. Second John, verses one through six. You did notice that I didn't say a chapter. Did you notice that? I wonder why I didn't say a chapter. I said Second John, verses one through six. Why did I say Second John, verses one through six? And I said no chapter. There's only one chapter. There's only one chapter, so there's no need for us to say chapter one, right? Second John, verses one through six is where we are tonight. All the way in the back of your Bible, right before you get to Revelation, you will see first John, second John, third John, then Revelation, amen? So we're in second John, verses one through six is where we will cover tonight. Who's the author, who's the writer? Who is the one that's pinning the words? The Apostle John is who we believe is the author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And John has been very, very consistent. He's been very consistent in warning the church about false doctrine. He's been very consistent in telling the church to love each other. John has been very consistent in telling us how we ought to live and depend on Jesus. He's been very consistent. It says to us as Christians or Christians or whoever we may call ourselves that we must be consistent in what we do and how we live. And so tonight John tells us to walk in that consistency. He, he admonishes us to whatever you do, regardless of what's outside of you that's going on, stay with consistency. Stay with love. Stay with truth. Throughout uh, 1 John, he talks about loving your brother, loving your neighbor, making sure that you are, are loving on people. Uh, John always tells us to make sure that we deal with people with a loving attitude, hospitality. Make sure that we operate through hospitality. Make sure we live under the anointing of God, anointing us. People think the anointing is only to make you shout. People think that God's Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit unction them, the Holy Spirit only unction you to make you shout. We ought to celebrate. We ought to have some emotions toward God. God is a good God. God is a precious God. But the anointing is more than to make us shout. Because once you get through shouting on Wednesday, Tuesday, Sunday, or whatever your worship time may be, God is looking forward to you walking in that love and in that truth. So the Holy Spirit himself dwells in us and he unctions us, he tells us, he feeds us, and he, he makes sure that he tells us over and over again, walk in the Lord. So that's what John is talking about tonight. Walking therein, walking therein, walking therein. And so Second John deals with the fact that he he greets what is known the elect lady or the lady of elect. Theologians have different beliefs of who John is talking to. And since you deem me as a theologian, I tell you what I think he's talking. Many think that he's talking to a specific lady. Many believe that he's talking to a lady with children. I personally believe that he's talking to the church. That would be consistency. Remember, every pericope has a complete thought. Every chapter carries its own thought. Every book carries a running theme. And tonight John's theme is consistent with 1 John. And tonight's theme is truth and love. 
The themes are truth and love. And when John deals in 1 John, he deals with the fact that there are false prophets out there. There's false doctrine, doctrine out there. There is heresy out there. And it is no different than what we face today. We face false doctrine. We face heresy. We face false prophets. And boy, every now and then a prophet will raise up and he will get the attention or she will get the attention of many and will lead those many astray. So John writes in, in 2 John, make sure you walk in the truth. Whatever you do, deal with what is true. He says, little children, I've told you the truth. When he talks about little children, he's talking about those who are brand new believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, you've heard the truth. Now walk in that truth. Turn him down, Psalm says Matthew. He says, when you acknowledge the truth, when you are born again, acknowledge that truth and walk therein. Walk in it. What is he talking about when he said walk in it? What is, he, what is he saying when he said walk in the truth? What is he talking about? Live with it. Live in it. Many times in the Bible it talks about our conversation. The conversation is not I don't talk. The conversation is your lifestyle. So we have to walk in it. Live in it. Our conversation that people see about us has to be the truth. What is the truth? What is the truth? What is the truth? The truth is the word of God as it is, as it is written. Mm -hmm. Taking nothing away from it and adding nothing to it. But when you take something away or you add something to it, guess what? It's called extra biblical. Mm -hmm. So it's extra when you add it in. It's extra when you take it out. So you got to make sure that you live in, walk in the truth. And none of us should be extra biblical. We want to be biblical. Our church is a word church. Our church is a word church. We want to operate in the word of God. Nothing less than the word of God. We don't want to operate in the Baptist company. Uh-oh. Did you grow up in a church, a Baptist church, where they had a big old yeah. six-foot covenant on the wall that nobody followed? The deacon that hung it didn't follow it. Nobody followed it. That Baptist covenant says when you relocate from one part of town to the other part of town or from one city to the other, one state to the other, when you relocate, you ought to join yourself with a local church. And we got members who left New Beginning 12 years ago and still talking about, this is my church. <laughs> that Baptist covenant said when you relocate, you ought to relocate your membership. The Baptist covenant says that you ought not sell liquor. You didn't know that? It says you ought not be given too much wine. Boy, all of us be cut off with it. Because in that covenant, it has so many rituals and so many do's and don'ts until the folk that wrote it can't follow it. That's what the problem was with the Old Testament. That's what the problem was with the law. People could not keep it. The law became a taskmaster. The law became something we couldn't follow. Can you imagine if the law was around today, we wouldn't have so much killing? You kill somebody, they kill you. If you guilty, if you found guilty, they have court right there on the spot. And it's over. You steal something, we'll have a lot of one armed children walking around here. You steal something with your, your right hand, they, they take that. That's right. Cut it off. If you lie, we got habitual lives. Some people think that they are much better when they lie. And and you lie, you cut your tongue. You tell no lie anymore. Well, some of us couldn't, most of us, all of us couldn't live during that time. 
Population will go in Houston alone from 4 million to 200. And before morning, it'll be zero. So, so John says to us, make sure we walk in the truth, the word of God. Stick with the word. Stand on the word. Live by the word. Act out the word. If somebody see you upset, you ought to refer to the word that's already in you. It's God's word, the truth. And you ought to take that word without anything added or taken away. Let's see what John says. Verse number one, the elder. And we know the word elder sometimes means the older person. And many times it also means the one who is mature in the word of God. So we believe the elder here is John himself. Look at what he writes. He says, elder to the elect lady in her children. So he, he lays out his greeting and he identifies who he's relating to and who he's writing to. He says, the elder is writing to the elect lady. This word elect here is the chosen lady. And we all know the church itself, the church herself, is female. The church herself is female. The church, when we address the church, when we refer to the church, we ought to say the church she, not the church he. And let me just tell you a misconception while I'm here. Many preachers talk about, and I'm not saying, I'm not dealing with this topic tonight, okay? <laughs> but many preachers says that the pastor has to be a man because the church is a woman. Well, first of all, the misconception here is that the pastor is not the groom of the bride. Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. So the pastor can be at best the best man just waiting on the groom to show back up. Because it's the groom, Christ himself, who has died for his bride. Every man that marries a woman needs to be committed to the fact that you're willing to die for that woman. Go ahead and look at it, Sister Whitlock. Are you going to ask him the question now? Ask him. Are you willing? <laughs> Are you really willing? <laughs> if the rubber meets the road, will you really give it up for me? I, I told my daughter and I told my wife, I'll take a bullet for you, I'll die for either one of you. But I'm not going to jail for any of you. <laughs> I don't want no flat peanut butter sandwiches anymore. I don't want any bologna sandwiches for 24, 48, 72 hours. But when a man comes to the point where he loves a woman so much that he can't do without her, he ought to be willing to die for her. And I know some men are not willing to die for her because they won't even take the trash out for her. <laughs> now, how are you willing to die for me? And you won't take the trash out. And some men are not willing to die for because they won't even stop watching the game for her. They won't even put it on pause for her. No, no, no. Steph Curry is going down the field. Baby, can you? Uh, he's going down the floor. Oh, he's about to do a good moving. And you're telling me you're willing to die for her? But you can't stop watching the game? Just a second, folks. Well, all the women in here want to say amen. They just looking right now. <laughs> they, just, they, they want to say amen. I was in Bible study one one night. I was asking questions, and and uh, when I was asking the question, I asked the brother the question, and he just sit there like this. He didn't move. And after a while, his wife said he got to go home with me. That's why he ain't here. <laughs> so the 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 apostle John. Why is he an apostle? Why are we calling him the apostle? What did, what did he do to become an apostle? He walked with Christ, right? So when, when we know he's an apostle, he's an elder, a leader of the church, we know that he's an apostle because he walked with Christ. 
We don't have to negotiate whether he was an apostle. We don't have to hammer it out to see if he's an apostle. He's, he's an elder. He's an apostle. He's writing to the elect lady. And I said to you already, I believe he's writing to the chosen of the church. And he says to her children. Her children, those who are in the body of Christ. I can confirm that with 1 John. 1 John, uh, he, he made it clear that those who walk with Christ, those new born again believers are the children. He called them little ones. So he continues, he says, whom I love in truth and not I only, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. He says, I love y'all. Not only does he say, I love you, I love you in truth. Here are those two words, love and truth. He's going to hammer it home throughout this book. Love and truth. We have to learn to love those who love the truth. Those who tell lies, Jude would say they snuck in unaware. If Jude says, beware of those who have snuck in unaware. There are some who have just snuck in. Jesus says in John chapter 10 that I am the door to the sheepfold. If no man come to me, then that man can't get into the sheepfold. And he says those who have come in, they may have clammed over the fence. They may have snuck in, and Jude says they snuck in on a way. So he says, he says, we, he says, first of all, I love the truth, and those who love the truth and those who are of the truth also love you. What would it be like if members of every church love members of every church? What would it be like if members just loved each other? Jesus says it like this. Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples based on your love one to the other. Can we see love? Can we show love? Can we demonstrate love? Can we commit to love? Let me tell you, we have to love individuals. John been hammering on them. How long have we been on John? Been there a long time, right? Do we have it yet is the question. And then after he leaves 1 John, he comes back to 2 John with the same thing. There's heresy out there. What is heresy? It's heresy. False teaching. False teaching, false doctrine. There's false doctrine out there. There are false teachers out there. There are people that are gathering up people for their own benefit. They're selling you stuff like prayer claws. They're blowing and spitting on you. And that's how the Lord is blessing you. False. I've told you several times, you can take my napkin home with you, all you're going to get is a bunch of sweat and a bunch of snot. The blessings come from the Lord. Yes, God uses men. Yes, God allows us to lay hand and they recover. But we ought not brag about it. It ought to not be a commercial. It ought to not be a show. When it becomes a show, it becomes pride. And guess what happens before pride? Right after pride. Pride comes before the fall. And you can look at them. You can hear them and how proud they are. So, so he says, make sure you stick with love and stick with the truth. He says... I love in truth. Not only do I love you in truth, all of those who have known the truth love you also. There's a signal of unity there. We, if we were really unified, well, we could, we could do some things. We could do some awesome things. Jesus took 12 men and turned the world upside down, and one of those 12 was a born devil. So it says to us, if we got 30, 40, 50, 500, we ought to be able to turn the world upside down, but it's going to take unity. We must be unified. 
He says, I love you. Not only do I love you, but those who are walking in truth, those who are in truth, love you also. Because the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Look at what he says. He says, we love you because the truth abides in us. And because the truth is in us, this truth is going to be in us forever. Tear the hole into getting saved two, three times. You get baptized two or three times, it doesn't matter because the old folk back home said he went in as a dry devil, he came out as a wet devil. So the water didn't say, there are members, <laughs> there are people that have come to this church to be baptized, and I only baptize once you have a faith in Jesus Christ. Because I believe that the baptism says to all of us who look on, it, on you, says that, that I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I believe that this story is the only story to take me to heaven. Therefore, I baptize. I'm not pressured to be baptizing. I'm not, I'm not baptizing just for a show. But if you just choose to go in the water one more time and you're convinced that you need to go in again, it's all right with me. I dump you as many times as you want to be dumped. I hold you down as long as you want to be held down. If you think the water is going to cleanse you real good, I hold you down until you shake and say, let me up. If you really, really think that water is making you clean. Now, we ought to baptize. We ought to baptize people that have been, that have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. We ought to do that. These things, Jesus said, these things we ought to do. But it's baptism. There's not saying your hand was up. Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I got baptized when I was seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Christian Home. But uh, when I went, I always felt I needed to be baptized again because I was so young. See me Sunday morning. I, I, how, how long do you want to stay on that? <laughs> How you want to come? Yo, you want baptism tonight? <laughs> All right then. <laughs> In other words, the baptism does not save us. This is a this is a formation that we go through to confirm to other people that we've been saved. And and you know I've tried to explain it over and over again, but people are just determined. And if you're determined, I'm determined also. It just gives me thrill to know that you want to commit yourself back. And some people believe because they have rededicated themselves, then they need baptism. That's fine with me also. But the, at the end of the day, you need to make sure, very sure, that you've committed your life to Jesus Christ. That he is your savior. That he has turned your life around. That he has made a difference in your life. That you believe this simple story of his death, burial, and resurrection. Some churches don't even have a baptism pool. Some people don't even baptize. I have a friend that doesn't have a baptism pool. I said, man, you ought to be thrown out of here. You, you ought to prepare for souls to come to Christ. You ought to prepare for baptism. You ought to prepare for discipleship. People ask me, why you got so many classrooms around here? Because we are to disciple people. Sunday morning, they can't get it all. That's why you're here on Wednesday night. People have to be taught. People have to be preached to. People have to be discipled. We come on Sunday morning to be energized. We come on, on Wednesday night to, to be energized and trained. And talk because there's heresy out there. How many of you have been approached by your neighbor or your co-worker or a friend telling you what you believe is not what you ought to believe? Mm -hmm. yep. That alone is a reason to be trained in Bible study and Sunday school. Mm -hmm. hmm? So that's why we got these guys who let me teach Sunday school every now and then. I mean, every now and then, they'll let me substitute for them because they do such an excellent job in chewing the word up and breaking it down and delivering it to the people. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm cheering them on. And every chance I get, I use what they say in my message because we are all on one accord in truth. And when we meet, we talk about how we can tie it all together. And so every now and then, they let the pastor come in and say a word or two. They give me 45 minutes, and I say that, and then I bag on out, and then they take it and run with it again. I personally believe that we ought to have members of the body who can sustain the body when the pastor is not present. I've already told Brother Whitlock, I've already told Brother Miles, the first time I get caught in a snowstorm, I don't have a time to call a preacher. Don't be surprised when Sunday, when they get up on a Sunday morning doing worship service. Well, They don't have to preach, but they have to teach. And they ought to be ready at a moment's notice. Because I really, really don't think they ought to be able to say, well, you know, you should have told me two weeks ago. Because as teachers, we are always, always love the word so much until we always have something to say about God. That's what he says. That's what he says right there in verses one and two. He, he talks about the fact that we ought to walk in unity. We ought to live in unity. And he says, this truth will be with us forever. This truth abides in us. The word that's in us comes out of us. Computers operate really well until they shut down. How many times computers shut your whole, the computer shut down and shut your whole day down? And you wish that you had a tablet like we used to have. We used to have a tablet and telephone. And that tablet and the telephone got all our work done, and it got done well. And the worst thing that can happen with a, with a tablet and a telephone is the phone line get cut or the pencil stop writing, and we just reach over and grab it. Now we have computers for everything. We have a phone that does everything. I think it was Morgan Freeman that says, if you tell people that their brains are the phone, then they may use it sometimes. <laughs> All you got to do is tell them it's a phone, it's a gadget. Then they start using their brain. The suggestion here is people are not using their brain. Like, how many people know five people other than your family members' phone numbers? Uh, other than your closest friend's phone numbers? Uh, how many people know five people's phone number that you met a month ago? How many people even worry about five people with the phone numbers? It's because... When we walk in unity, we realize that things going to be here forever. And we think our phones and our tablets will hold stuff forever. But let me tell you, just like a computer, your phone and your tablet, garbage in, garbage out. Nothing in, nothing out. You can't expect it to give out. And even your Alexa won't give out anything other than what's been put in it. Tell us, Sister David, our Alexa is unsaved. <laughs> is not born again. I mean, she knows everything. You can ask her about a sports character, she'll tell you. Ask her about an entertainer, she'll tell you. Ask her about a date in history, she'll tell you. But if you ask her about Jesus Christ, she'll give you a one-line blurb, the Son of God, and she has nothing else to say. But they tell me if I play the, pay for the extended warranty or the extended plan, guess what? I won't listen to what Alexis has to say because I ain't paying for no extra stuff. And guess what? Now Alexis has been shut down for the pandemic since the pandemic. She has been sitting there. And she, she turns on and she turns her off. Then she starts talking to you when you're not asking her question. If we told people that their brains was an Alexa or phone, they'll start using it more. So what we have to understand is the truth is out there. And people have come to the conclusion that everything on the internet is true. Do you not know that somebody had to put that on the internet? Right. And whatever is put on the internet was put on there based on that person's bent or that person's background or that person's history? 
You know, you can, I, in seminary, I can tell when students gone have gone on the internet and got the whole paper. <laughs> they present me with the paper, and it sounds bookish. Don't you know, Sister Woods, if you present me with a paper, I'm looking for the same way you talk every day. <laughs> and then when they get up to present their papers, Brother Miles, they can't even pronounce the words. They could have just clicked and right clicked and got a better word. That's right. They can't even pronounce the word on their paper. That tells me they're not walking in truth. When you're walking in truth, you leave the word as the word is. And you study the word and you regurgitate the word based on the word. Not on the internet. The internet are raising our children. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I want to go back to the baptism. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. The way you present for us, I mean, nowadays, to about the baptism, that you believe in Jesus Christ and all this. But they didn't tell you that back then, but you got baptized. Yeah. So, if you had rededicated your life, wouldn't you want to be rebaptized? Yeah, some people do. But let me just certainly notice, and I believe my percentages are right. I believe that 98% of people who got baptized were not saved when they got baptized. Why do I say that? None of us really understood, but in the 20th century, you did what folks said do. <laughs> now, children today, they don't do what parents say do. But we, they, they coached us to the best of their abilities. And they told us to the best of their abilities. And, and see, nowadays, the pastor has a doctor degree or a master's degree or a bachelor's degree or associate degree in ministry or theology or something. He's been to school. And when, when I came up, I don't think Dr. Allen, uh, uh, Pastor Allen had any degree. But check this out. He was the most educated person in the church. So he had an eighth grade education, and I'm just, just throwing this out here. I don't know that he had an eighth, eighth grade education, but the pastor may have had an eighth grade education, but his audience was on a third grade education level. And so they told us as they knew. And as we studied the word, then we learned more. That's why we're in here today. We're learning more, and therefore we're able to defend the faith. It's called apologetics. We're able to defend the faith. It's not to argue the faith, but to defend the faith. Because Jehovah's Witnesses have been eating us alive. Seven-day Adventists have been eating us alive in our own house, in our own kitchen table. Because we won't stick to the truth. And guess what? They are really, really adamant about it. And they are really, really assertive about it. And they really, really are staying on top of it. Whereas we as Christians, if somebody saves, we, we are clear. Mm -hmm. We celebrate more for money than we do for soul coming to Christ. When a soul comes to Christ, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice. They raise the roof. They shut heaven down just to praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That one soul have come. We get a soul that come down the aisle in most churches. I know not at this church, but we've been trained to celebrate when a soul come to Christ. We get a soul to come to Christ down here. We kind of look at them like, yeah, glad to hear. But when, we, when you say we, 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 2011, I think it was, we saved $350,500. Ooh, people shot all over the place. I want this church to be known for celebrating God for souls more than money. Because if you get souls and you get them discipled, money will come. And you don't have to stand in the pulpit and say, come money, money's coming. The same guy that used to say money coming now saying that tithe and offering is not what you're supposed to be doing. But now he's rich off of tithe and offering. John says, stick to the truth. Stick to it. Then you have others who say, well, you give your tithe and offering, and you decide before it gets to the offering basket, you decide what goes to the pastor, what goes to the church. Stick to the truth. The truth of the matter is, you make sure 
you make very sure that you give 10% of your gross income to the Lord off the top. You giving it to the Lord, to the Lord's bride, to the Lord's church. And then the people that are employed, whether they're volunteers or not, the people who are employed by the church are to disperse it where the pastor's taking care of. Now, if I change that in six months, y'all tell me about it. Because it's my responsibility to stick to the truth. It's not our place to take God's place, and it's not our place to take the people's place. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that I might have meat in my house. And some of that meat is to take care of the pastor. Amen. Some of that meat is for the air conditioning and the, and the heater and the, and the lights. But it's not your place, and don't let anybody tell you, and I'm, I'm on this money thing because it's dealing with unity, right? So don't let anybody tell you you take your 10% of your tithes and offerings, split it, and give it to anybody for their bills, or anybody for their doctor bills, or anybody for their, for their food. That's your mission. You take your mission out of your 90%. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's cold turkey, but it's good when you're home. It's good when you're home. Look at verse 3. <coughs> verse 3 says, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. This is from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the God in truth and love. The Son of the God, the Father himself. It says grace. God gives us grace. God gives us mercy. He gives us peace. But it will only be with us if we expect it through the Father in the Son. Grace, peace, mercy can only be present with us through the Lord God himself from Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the Father in truth and love. Jesus has compassion on us. Love is what Jesus communicates to us. Grace is what Jesus gives us. Mercy is what Jesus grants us. It is all from the Father. You see the unity again? Here we have the Father and the Son working together in unison and unity to make sure that the bride of Christ is well taken care of. Where there's no Christ in your life, you won't have grace, you won't have peace, and you won't have mercy. The devil, the devil awards people for stuff. He makes it look good. Then they drive what they want to drive. They live in what they want to live in. They go where they want to go. They participate in what they want to participate in. And it looks good on the outside. But let me serve you notice. Every house can't be a home. Every ride cannot be a car. Every bed, you can have a kit. What's the biggest one? Cow King now? Is that it? And I think Shaq got this big old round bed that he can. You can have a big bed big enough to put Shaquille O'Neal in. But because you have a bed doesn't mean you're going to have rest. God has to give it to you. Peace without war. And do we need peace in the great United States of America? Yeah. We need peace. Yes, we need peace, and we need peace right now. He talks about this unity in this verse, verse 3. He talks about this unity between the Father and the Son. But he, he reminds us that there's equality in the two. You see, when you're in a household, you have a mother and a father, you have a male and a female, you have, you have a home. Everybody has their place. The husband is not more important than the wife. The wife is not more important than the husband. When they walk together in unity, God blesses the home. When they fail to walk together in unity, God cannot bless the home. Men, men will say, well, I'm the man of the house. You got to do what I say do. First of all, she's already been raised. 
one person said amen. amen. The folk with men sit next to them, they can't say amen. The women with, the women with men sitting next to them, they, they can't say amen right there. They don't want, they don't want to deal with it when they get in the car. So when you when you look at Ephesians and you read Ephesians 5 and it talks about the fact that the man ought to love his wife unconditionally. The man ought to love his wife so much that he gives his life for her. Then it talks about how the, how the, the wife ought to be submissive. In the 21st century, we think the word submissive is a derogatory word. Every time I do a wedding, I say, and to obey him, I dare to stumble. I said, and richer and poor, and they just say that so smoothly, and richer and poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to keep and to cherish and to obey, and everything goes silent. You can hear the crickets. Why does that happen? Right. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and that's where I was going. Ephesians chapter 5, right around verses 20 and 21 and 22. Ephesians 5, 21, 20, 21, and 22. It talks about how, how we ought to be on one accord and how we ought to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. That gets rid of the argument. Submitting to one another. So, brother, she's not just supposed to submit to you. You have to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. You have to submit to one another because we want this train to keep riding smoothly on the track. Somebody said, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> Somebody said, if mama ain't happy, the whole house is in a uproar. So you want the train to, it, it's not about proving who you are. It's about keeping the train moving smoothly down the road. Are you with me? Through every curve, every bend, we ought to be on one accord. And we are both equally responsible for each other. We're both equally responsible for the household. That's what he says here. He says, he says Jesus, the Son of God, and God, the Father. And, and they, he ties the two in with each other. There, they, there is equality there. God, deliver me from people who want to have this, this way, this, that way. I, I haven't understood it yet. And I, you do what you do in your household, but I haven't understood it yet. I got my account, you got your account, but your name on your account, my name on mine, you should have stayed single. You, you, you're better off a single person. Because at the, at the end of the day, it's okay to have how many other accounts you want to have. You can have three, four accounts, but everybody ought to be on every account, and everybody ought to be aware of what's going on on every account. Can I get an amen right there? <laughs> well, Pastor, I don't really approve of that. <laughs> well, if you can't trust the man, you shouldn't have married him. If you can't trust them to have money or allow you to have the money, you shouldn't have married. If you can't trust the sister that she's going to go out, one, one woman shows up on, I ask Steve, and she says, Steve, uh, can you help me get something over to my husband? I bought some $2,000 boots, and he didn't understand, but he always tell me to buy whatever I want to. Even Steve Harvey had to say, you did what? <laughs> but if you agree on those $2,000 boots, Get them. It's a matter of unity. So that's what the text says in verse 3, that Jesus Christ, God the Father, they abide and they walk in unity. And they work in unity. And we're not going to get to verses 4, 5, and 6 tonight. They walk in unity. They are one in unity. They are unified. They operate together. They live together. They operate together. They believe the same thing. Have, and did you notice that when Jesus was leaving, he says to his disciples in John 14, he says, I got to leave you now. But I will not leave you comfortless. The comforter will come. And the comforter will show you all things. Matter of fact, the comforter will affirm the things I've already told you. Do you notice Jesus moved off the scene 
and the Holy Spirit moved in. There was no fist fight. There was no showdown at the OK Corral. Jesus moves off the scene. He goes up to heaven. He takes his place on the right hand of the Father. He's making intercession for us. The Holy Spirit is now living in us. Before Jesus came, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Genesis, the Holy Spirit moved over the earth. It hovered over the earth. But after Jesus came, the Holy Spirit was ushered in, and now he lives in us. That's why the songwriter says he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me that I am his own. He says it about Jesus, but it's Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit. I'm from Houston. By way of Indianola, Mississippi, by way of Bells on Mississippi. So what happens is the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they operate as one. And that's why, why Paul says in Philippians that he started not robbery to be equal to God. In other words, he wasn't upset when God chose him to put on a body and come down here in his mean word. In other words, Jesus did not think it was subservient of him to leave glory to come to planet Earth where mean men would kill him. It did not stop him from being the deity. He's still God. Therefore, we have what is known as the hyperstatic union. What's the hyperstatic union? 100% man, 100% God. So Jesus is just as much God as God and just as much man as man. And because he's just as much God as God and just as much man as man, in this physical man flesh body, he is the son of God. But also, he is deity also. And, he, and, and, and Paul says he thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He wasn't robbing God's deity. He just is God. A lot of people have a problem with him. So, Sister Paul, a lot of people have a problem with him being God. Some people have a problem with Jesus being God. That's what, that's what separates us, Sister Hughes. That's what separates us. Our God, Jesus, our Savior, our Commander-in-Chief died for us. Whereas we see the Commanders-in-Chief all over the world. Putin is just sitting back and people getting killed. Because their God sent men and women off to war to die for them. Our commander in chief, he never leaves the White House, but he gives orders for war. But our commander in chief, Jesus, he went to war on our behalf. And some thought he was losing the fight, but he won the fight. Even in his death, he won the fight. He sacrificed himself. A voluntary death. He died for you and for me. Thank God for Jesus. We couldn't get to God without Jesus. We can't live for God without the Holy Spirit. And we could not go to be with God beside without God the Father. They got it all figured out. That's why Jesus says, Put up the sword, Peter. Put up the sword. Now, Peter has gone in. They come to arrest Jesus. Peter has gone into the darkness. He sees the soldier reaches for Jesus. He takes his knife and cut off Malchus' ear. Cuts it off. Jesus reaches down, picks up Malchus' ear, plants it back on his shoulder, and looks at Peter and says, put up the sword. W.G. Glenn says that, that he was trying to get him killed in a midnight brawl when God already had it figured out that he was going to go to Calvary and die. They, they don't, they, you don't see no argument in the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why do we have arguments and jealousy among ourselves in the body of Christ? And we say we're the body of Christ. We say we're the bride of Christ. We actually believe that because we are the body of Christ, we have power. 
We have power. Let me tell you something. Some of that power ought to be demonstrated to you living for the Lord and walking with him. Oh, the Holy Spirit hit me today. No, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't hit you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He dwells in you. He reminds you of, of who you are. And he gives you power and hope to walk right. To deal with folk you don't even, even like. Even folk you don't like in church. Not in this church, but in other churches. And folk that you don't even get along with. Because my definition of a clique in church is just a, just a gangster group. It's just your own little gang. And some preachers have the nerve that that's to stand up. Oh, I got my gang here tonight. That's separations of the body. That's right. We want to be unified. And Jesus came to unify. He died for us. He was buried for us. He rose. <coughs> the door of the church is open. Amen. The invitation is extended. We got to trust Jesus as our Savior. Yes, yes. Jesus died for us. Yes, he did. Even though he knew we would be sinners, mm -hmm. he knew we would not do the right thing. He died for us. He was buried for us, but he rose for us. That same Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for you and me. Amen. Even though we messed up, Thank he's saying to God, Thank God, you. I died. So when God looks at us as we confess our sins, he sees the blood of Jesus, he just passed us over. Because God sees his son's blood over our lives and he he gives us another chance. So if you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You can receive him today. If this is you, just bow your head with me and repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, we believe that you're now born again. And we believe if you die, you're going to heaven. When you die, you're going to heaven. And if you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Where Jesus is the main attraction. Jesus is the one who we honor. I recommend the New Beginning Church. If you want to join our church, be a part of our church, or you want any more information about our church, please inbox me and let, you know, let us know. We'll be glad to welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We thank God for blessing us again tonight. Announcement that uh, that I failed to make on Sunday because I had a, a, a new um, PowerPoint presenter. Um, this Sunday I'll be celebrating 18 years as the pastor of the New Beginning Church. 18, 18 glorious years. 18 years as the pastor of the New Beginning Church. Our, our preacher for the day will be Pastor Richard Booker. He will be here at our 1030 service. We want everybody to join us live and, uh, and color, in color, in person, as well as online. Please uh, join us to celebrate 18 great years of, from pastor the New Beginning Church. 18, 18 years. I want to keep those on our prayer list in mind. Uh, continue to lift up the Galvan family uh, for bereavement as well as, as sickness. We want to lift, lift up the Galvan family. Um, they're usually here before we get here on Sunday morning. And for the last two Sundays, maybe three, they have not been available. So we want to lift them up. Amen. Uh, the Galvan family. Uh, he is... Uh, one of our interpreters for our Spanish congregation. Uh, she's the one that runs our PowerPoint. 
and their daughter is the one who, who plays the keyboard on Sunday morning. And so we want to lift this family in prayer. But we want to also lift up uh, the Brandon family. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they are celebrating 45 years of marriage. Amen. 45 years, that's a good place to rejoice right there. 40, 45 years, I'm looking forward to my 45th year. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, and we, we celebrate with this family. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord, we bless your name, and thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for 18 years. 18 years of of pastoring the New Beginning Church. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us. Thank you for blessing our church to be a beacon light that's shining in a dark and dismal world. We pray for our sick and our bereaved, Father God. We ask you to comfort them and keep them. We pray for our confused, those who, who don't have great understanding of what you're doing in their lives. We ask you to give them direction, give them clarity. Give them hope. Give them strength. Now, Lord, we thank you for the New Beginning Church. We ask you to bless our church. We ask you to continue to walk with us. Continue to lead us, guide us, and direct us. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless us, Father God, that we will bless others. Bless us that we will move forward in your name, Father God, and we will always hold to the truth, the word of God. That we will never give in to any heresy, no false doctrine and no false prophets. We ask you to protect us, Father God, from the wolves of this world. Bless our children as they continue to go to school. Bless them to be safe. Bless them to be alert. Bless them to be focused. Give them wisdom in all their dealings, Father God. Bless them to have a hunger, a thirst, and a desire for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Bless us as we come to yield. We ask you to bless every giver. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank God. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord. We tithe, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. For those of you who are giving electronically, you can do so by giving to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail in your offering to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 that's Missouri City, Texas P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 if you want to give while you're in this room raise your hand if you need to be served with an envelope and you will be served it's time to give unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. While we stand to be this Father God, we thank you for Bible study. We thank you for your word of truth. We thank you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us to live out and walk out this word. That your word, Father God, will be real to us and that we will deliver it to others. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bind us together in unity. And bless us, Father God, to be close where one can't fall for the other. We pray, Father God, that you protect us and keep us. Bless us, Father God, as we go forth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.